What's going on guys, Carmine here, and today we'll be taking a look at the brand new Game of Thrones trailer from HBO. This is the second trailer for Season 7, and we got a couple of new footage from it. Some of the scenes I'll be skipping because they were reused from the first trailer, but uh, we'll also be discussing the second trailer on the next episode of the Game of Thrones podcast, which will be after show episode 3, so look forward to that. Also leave your comments and questions below for a follow-up Q&A video to the second trailer. Now with that out of the way, let's get to it. Now, the first scene we get in the trailer is of Sansa, still in Winterfell, with the weirwood behind her while Peter Baelish tells her not to fight in the north or the south, but to fight every battle everywhere. I like that. Even now, Baelish is still counseling Sansa. There have been rumors that he doesn't survive past this season, which is a shame, if true, because he's always been that guide that Sansa has needed in her life to get her through things. But I do like that, even in Season 7, he'll be scheming and trying to control things. Sansa, on the other hand, is who I'll be focusing on because... When everything is said and done, I feel like she'll be the very last Stark. Jon, Bran, and Arya are all going to be participating in the final battle with Sansa once again on the sidelines, which is, which is okay. Even if they all go down, she'll be the very last Stark left, which would be disappointing, but deserved. Sansa has never really been at the forefront of House Stark, and after everything she's been through and learned, it'll be good to see her with some power, kicking ass, and taking names. Next up, we have a scene beyond the wall. It looks like Bran and Mira are entering Castle Black. You can tell it's them because she has to keep dragging him on that sled. Now, Mira has always been an interesting character for me, and there will be some rumors that once she she leaves Bran off at Winterfell, that we won't see her till Season 8, which is fine, but I was hoping for a kind of Bran and Mira relationship thing going on, but I understand why it's not a thing. Bran is still supposed to be like... 12 or 13 like keep in mind that it's only been three years since season one so he's supposed to be a little kid but puberty hit this guy like a ton of bricks i swear last season i saw some chest hair and a mustache but i will say i that I, i'm gonna miss mira even though she doesn't do too much and isn't as beloved as hodor she does still add something to Bran's group, but once again, I get why she has to go. Bran is going to go back to Winterfell and all the Starks are converging yet again, so Bran doesn't really need his own group, but hopefully she does come back next season with some soldiers from House Reed to back up everybody else. Next up, we have a quick shot of King's Landing, and it looks like they're fully embracing the Lannisters with some banners all over the city. Some of us already know who it is the Gold Cloaks are escorting through the city, but for those of you who don't, then I won't say it here, but it will be kind of, of a surprise for those of you who uh, haven't read the leaks or haven't been keeping up with some of the rumors. After that, we cut back to Danny over at Dragonstone. In the first trailer, I thought that she was using Stannis' war room table as her own, but it looks like that when Stannis left Dragonstone, he left behind a lot of his own things, including the little map markers and even his own banner, which she takes down. I will say I'm still mad that Danny doesn't have her own Red Priestess, which we saw last season in the form of Kinvara. If you recall, Kinvara is the one who spoke to Tyrion and Marine and spooked Varys a little in their first meeting. I really wanted Danny to have her own Red Priestess like Stannis and not be swayed so easily like he was. I want that as a contrast between these two. Like, for five seasons, Stannis has been persuaded to accept the Lord of Light's ways, and we've seen that, and then we get Danny, and she is having none of that crap. It would have been a nice contrast, and who knows, maybe we'll get it, because in the last trailer, we saw Melisandre back on Dragonstone for some reason. We also get some nice shots of the dragons flying towards Dragonstone, and Grey Worm heading towards some cave. Now this could be the same cave that Melisandre and Davos used to have Renly killed. If that is the case, then maybe I'll finally get my wish after all, and Danny will be taking Storm's End. As a Baratheon fan, I'm excited for this because we'll finally see what Storm Ends looks like, and you guys know me, I'm a sucker for awesome locations and cool buildings. But if this turned out to be Cashley Rock, the Lannister main castle, I'd be just as happy. Tyrion was in charge of the sewers at Cashley Rock when he and his father still lived there, so it's possible that he knows some secret entrance way into the castle. So, this could be Cashley Rock that the Unsullied are sneaking into. Who knows? Either way, I'm excited. Next up, we get a shot of Podrick and Captain Phasma. I wasn't a big fan of Brienne for the past two seasons, mainly because I feel like she's been kind of sidelined a bit. But that's to be expected. She's in Star Wars now, and she's very busy. You know, being in Star Wars for less than three minutes. Real busy. Seriously though, Brienne hasn't done anything cool since the beginning of Season 5 when she beat up those Knights of the Vale. Hopefully she and Podrick will be doing more, but that is highly unlikely. Brienne's goal is to be Sansa's protector and Aaron girl. I doubt we'll be seeing Brienne do much other than interacting with Torment and Arya. But I do hope we get a Hound reunion though. That would be cool between, you know, Brienne and Arya and the Hound. That would be pretty sweet. 
And speaking of the Hound, if you blink you'll miss it. He appears very briefly in the trailer twice, once in the snow and once in a sunny location not wearing a coat. It's possible that this is during a King's Landing scene because we do see a Lannister soldier in the background in a ruins. So possibly the Dragon Pit in King's Landing, which used to be a thing back during the Targaryen rule, but is now in ruins, of course. But wait a minute, if the Hound is in King's Landing, does that mean we'll finally be getting Clegane Bowl? Oh shit, get hyped! No, seriously, that would be great. Both of them died and are now reborn again in different ways. I love it. I would really like Clegane Bowl, but if I know these cock-teasing showrunners, and I think I do, they'll probably just give us a small hint of it and not deliver. Those bastards. But we'll have to see. Next up, we have some cool shots of the Lannister soldiers going up against the Dothraki. We may not get the Unsullied going into Phalanx formation, but these guys will, and it will be interesting to see how the Dothraki fare against trained soldiers in formation with armor and spears. The main thing the Dothraki have going for them, much like the Ironborn, is that they're good in hit-and-run raids. In the field, it'd be interesting because there are so many of them, and they all have horses, so it's a bit of a toss-up. They're more into overwhelming their foes with numbers and fast attacks, but one-on-one, -on -one, against the seasoned knight, they wouldn't be able to do much. Remember what happened when Jorah fought against one of Khal Drogo's men back in Season 1? Jorah wasn't fast, but his defense was good enough to deliver a killing blow. It'll be interesting, but what really gives them an edge is the dragon. That always turns the tide of any battle. I mean, if you've played Total War Warhammer like I have, then you'll know that a dragon means the difference between winning comfortably to what the fuck just happened. So yeah, there's that. I also love the shot we get of Jamie charging in there like a boss, and it looks like he almost got roasted by a dragon and wants to go back in there and take it down. If anything, he's got balls, which may or not be made of gold, but whatever. Next up, we have some shots of many ravens or crows, whatever you want, flying over the Night's King, possibly Bran controlling them to scat out the scope of his army and where they are. I like this because it gives Bran a lot of importance, not just as a character, but as war potential. And when I say war potential, I mean people who are essential to winning the final battle. This includes people who are intelligent, like Sam and Tyrion, and people who carry Valyrian steel swords like Brienne and Jon. Bran now possesses some amount of skill to do more than just show us cool flashbacks. I love this, and I also love how he has a wheelchair now. All he needs is to shave off his hair and we'll have the Game of Thrones version of Professor X. Nice. Very nice. And this would also be fitting because Sansa is obviously Jean Grey, and Tormund can be Beast, while Brienne can be Colossus. Holy shit, I think we almost have all the X-Men now. Somebody photoshop them all together and make this happen. Also, there is one more person with Bran. It could be Davos, it could be some random maester, or it could be the Three-Eyed Raven. He's supposed to be dead, but maybe he left a bit of his mind inside Bran's mind, and maybe Bran is seeing him whenever he touches a weirwood tree. It would be interesting to have that, and kind of cool. I always enjoyed their discussion, so it'd be nice to have more of that. Next up, we have more shots of the Ironborn fleet heading towards King's Landing, and of Euron doing some work. I've always respected the leader who goes in there and does the fighting along with the troops. Damn straight, Euron. Make the Iron Islands great again, buddy. We also get the last confirmation that it is Euron who is attacking Yara's fleet. Now, I can't tell who this is, running out there and jumping with a bow in, in the hand, but it's possibly Yara fighting back, though I doubt she gets away considering in the last trailer, she and Ilaria are somehow together, going all lesbian on each other. So it's possible that she does get captured, but I hope she doesn't go out like a punk. I do like Yara's character, and it's a shame we don't get to see more of her, but hopefully this season will give her more to do. I'm also happy that the Ironborn aren't taking a back seat this season, and will be in there with the bulk of the fighting. This is good. Now all we need is the Dornish soldiers and the Tyrell soldiers to get in on this, and then I'll be incredibly happy with Season 7. And finally, we get Jon Snow, Davos, and even Beric Dondarrion beyond the wall for some reason. There have been rumors that they're going beyond the wall to find proof of the White Walker threat and bring it back to everyone so they can all unite. Now, this is a large plot hole because this has been done before. When the Whites attacked Gior Mormont back in Season 1, Jon killed it, and, correct me if I'm wrong, Alistair Thorne was sent to King's Landing to show Joffrey the hand of the White that attacked him. This was in Season 1, Episode 9. It's why we don't see Thorne until Season 4. I don't know if it's ever explained why Thorne never made it to King's Landing, or if he did and got sent away, why did he get sent away, but this has happened before. Hopefully it gets cleared up. In the books, this is actually cleared up, but we'll go into that later in the Game of Thrones podcast. But I am really enjoying the preview we're getting from their Beyond the Wall trip. The Fellowship of Winter is what I'm calling them. Hashtag Fellowship of Winter. We got the Hound, Beric, Davos, Jon Snow, and possibly Thoros of Mir. Now all we need is a wisecracking dwarf, a wisecracking sellsword, and a man with no cock, and we have the Game of Thrones version of the Avengers. 
No, seriously, this trailer has got me really excited. Barrack has taken on his flaming sword, which, by the way, makes him a war potential, and we'll be getting another White Walker fight and a Dawn of the Dead type scene where the Frost Zombies are running towards our small group. One thing we never do see is horror in our fantasy, and I like that Game of Thrones dances around that. It's a nice touch of pace from all the boobs and dragons to get what we got last season when the Night's King invades the Three-Eyed Raven Sanctuary. I like it, and it's always good to sprinkle some different genres in this show to give us a bit more of everything, you know? But overall, the trailer was fantastic. There was no signs of Sam or any new characters we might be getting, but you do get a sense of that we're almost at the end. I like it. I left some things out so we can discuss them later on in the Game of Thrones podcast, which will be out sometime next week, so look forward to that. But guys, let me know what you thought about the trailer. Did it show too much? Did it show too little? Because these kind of things can happen in a trailer. I mean, look at Terminator Genesis. The entire plot of that movie was spoiled in the trailers, so it kind of fell flat. Did HBO commit this sin just now, or was it just right for you? But as always, leave your thoughts down below and your questions as well, and I'll be discussing them in a follow-up video, possibly tomorrow. Once again, guys, thank you so much for watching. As always, leave a like. If you enjoyed the video, subscribe if you haven't already, and consider supporting me on Patreon. For $1, all supporters receive exclusive content and early access to the Game of Thrones podcast before it's everywhere else. Guys, once again, thank you so much for watching. As always, I'll see you next time. Baba Booey.